All right, we have two verses this morning, and Ian's going to help me read the first one, and then Lewis is going to help read the second one, and you can help join in the yellow. All right, you ready? It's from Ephesians 4, 31 to 5, 2. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. Therefore, dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. All right, this is from Philippians 2, 3 to 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made, made himself, himself nothing, nothing by, by taking, taking the very nature of a servant, servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Our first text in Ephesians told us not to be filled with bitterness, rage, anger, slander. Our world has a lot of that. But no matter how full of vitriol or how much disdain, we in the church are not to be that way. We are, according to our text, in Ephesians and Philippians to in humility value others above ourselves to be kind and compassionate forgiving others as in Christ God forgave us some of us are deeply sad that Donald Trump won the election some of us would have been deeply sad if Kamala Harris had won. But this morning, I want us to focus on what we personally have control over. It's a recipe for frustration when you stew on what you don't have control over. We had control over what we voted, but not for the outcome. No matter how, no matter what good or what bad the White House does, we have a calling that we can carry out, a mission that we can work at and by God's grace accomplish. In each of our texts, in Ephesians and Philippians, the example of Jesus is what is lifted up as our calling, as our mission. We are told to walk in the way Christ walked. We are told to have the same mindset that Jesus had. This morning, we're going to look at at what the apostles had in mind when they told us to walk as Christ walked, to have the same mindset. We speak of ourselves as followers of Christ. We are Christians. Well, what does that mean? What are we to do as we follow Jesus? What behavior do the apostles 
specify when they talk about us following Jesus. They don't talk about us wearing sandals like Jesus probably, surely did. They don't talk about us wearing a robe like he would have. They don't point to him not getting married. They don't point to him not owning a house. They don't even talk about us praying like Jesus did or loving sinners like Jesus did. But they do specify something that they have in mind that we are to do as we follow Jesus. Four different places in the New Testament, the, the attitude, the actions of Jesus that we are to follow are specified. And each time they point to one thing, the same thing, four different places. Here's what they specify. Sacrificial love for others. Love that sacrifices oneself for another. Here's our text again. The end of Ephesians 4, the beginning of chapter 5. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That's the NIV, the New Living Translation, loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Jesus did that, and we are to do it too. It will not be a sacrifice for atonement, but it will be us giving of our self, of our very life. In the beginning of, of chapter 2 of Ephesians, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who made himself nothing, the ESV, who emptied himself. He made the decision not to hold on to the prerogatives or the advantages that he had, but to be willing to let it go for others. So he, he came to this earth. He took the position of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Ephesians 2 says, even death on the cross, the most the lowest, most horrible position that anyone, you could make a case for that anyone in history had ever taken. I said there's four texts. Uh, here's one of the other texts. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And we'll look at the fourth uh, passage in a bit. So living like Jesus means willingness to sacrifice for others, to give up something of ours that we would like to cling to. And I want you to note, why did Jesus do this? Why are we to do this? Is it because God is interested in self-denial? You know, God just wants us to put ourselves and our needs down as if we have little worth? Not at all. <clears throat> That's not the motive. That's not what is going on. We do it for another. It's a sacrifice to help someone, to transform the other. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Philippians chapter 2. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. 
1 Peter 2, Christ suffered for you. We accept a loss. We make that sacrifice because we see the great good that can come from it. There's joy in it because our act is a creative, a generous, a, a positive act in what it brings to others. This, this is our mission. This is our highest call. It's not to elect someone to the highest office of our land who, even though they are the best choice, we know they're going to do a lot of things we disagree with and hold a lot of values that are contrary to ours. That's not our highest calling. Our highest calling is to follow Jesus, to, to name Jesus Lord, to tell his story to others, to witness how he saves us, how he rescues us, and to live like Jesus, showing that love that sacrifices ourself for another. That's our mission. And the rest of this morning, we're going to celebrate the goodness of that mission, of that calling, the good that comes into our lives and into the lives of those around us as we live and act the way that Jesus did. We don't need to be basing our future on the good that might come from a politician. But base our future on the good that comes from Jesus as we honor him, as we follow him, as we pin our hopes on him, take our marching orders from him. What happens when we live like Jesus and sacrifice ourselves for another? Basically, as we do, all heaven breaks loose. We get foretastes of heaven. Take, for instance, marriage. Those of us who go into marriage... Uh, <clears throat> We go into it because we have needs that we think will, will get met through this marriage. We're drawn to someone because we have experienced a bunch of our needs getting met by them. And of course, we know that we have to contribute too. We have to give as well as receive. We have to make it fair. So... <clears throat> We can tend to go into marriage thinking, okay, this is something that needs to be 50-50. I need to give and the other needs to give. Each of us contribute around half of what the marriage needs in order to thrive. Isn't that sort of the normal, natural approach to marriage? We think that we're doing good if we give our fair share. But such a marriage faces a continual frustration because no two persons keep score the same. What he thinks is him giving his fair 50, she thinks it might not even be 30. It's probably less than 30. You expect to give 50 and get 50, and you're going to find continual frustration. But there is a way to make marriage a bit of heaven, and that's to live like Jesus. Like how the Apostle Paul tells husbands and wives to live toward the end of Ephesians 5. Paul, in what he says, <clears throat> is far from 50-50. He rather, he instructs the woman to give 
You can read it the end, toward the end of Ephesians 5. And he calls the man to give 100%. I'm going to read this verse because this is that fourth passage that specifies what we are to do as we follow Jesus. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul is calling the man to give 100%. You are to focus on sacrificing yourself for your wife just as Christ sacrificed for the church. And how does giving 100% work? Well, I will tell you, often it doesn't feel fair as we are doing it. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work, you know, bring a, a response of love from the one that we are loving. This is a fallen world, so it is a risk. But I tell you, being in a relationship where each is trying to give more than their 50% and they're, you know, they're working toward the 100, that is a bit of heaven on earth. There's nothing more fun than when two people are trying to outdo each other in showing love. In this fallen world, there will be days when our flesh is screaming, it's not fair because that day it feels like the other and maybe that week, that month, that year, the other is only giving a little bit, you know, the 30% or lower. But as we continue giving 100%, not for what we're going to get, but because we are followers of Jesus, we are ones who are called to live like him in this particular way. As we do, the odds are that there's going to be a response someday and that heaven will begin to open up already, a foretaste of it already. And this works not just in marriages, but also with friends, with classmates, with co-workers. Surveys show again and again that the people who are happiest are the ones who are self-giving, not the people who are always pursuing what they want. That's, that's an amazing statistical result. Those who are trying to get their happiness, trying to get their way, are not happy. And those who are giving to others, that's their mode of operation, are happiest. And, and I want to say again, uh, <clears throat> Remember, the reason is not to put ourselves down, not because we don't have any worth. You know, that's not why we sacrifice, but it's, it's for the sake of the other. So we're not talking about us being a doormat, us letting the other just walk over us. Not at all. We are not sacrificing for the sake of sacrifice. We are sacrificing for the sake of the other. When Paul was talking to husbands, for her. And he goes on to make her holy. Uh, like this is how Jesus loved the church. Sacrificing himself for her to make her holy. To present her to himself as a radiant bride without stain or wrinkle. Interestingly, there were times when Jesus and the Apostle Paul did not turn the other cheek. You know, we're supposed to sacrifice, right? We're supposed to turn the other cheek. You can read it for yourself. John 18, Acts 23. There were times when Jesus confronted persons rather than yielding, rather than sacrificing, you know, what he felt. But until we are willing to sacrifice, we will not be able to accurately discern what 
will help another. Until we are willing to sacrifice ourselves, we will not let ourselves really see when that is something that can transform, do marvelous good in the other person. Another example, and I think this is perhaps the most important element in human interaction. Um, it's the primary thing that every good marriage needs, a primary thing, and you cannot be a good parent without this. You can't be a good friend. I'm talking about this activity and skill of listening. Good listening involves a continual series of choices to give of ourselves to another, to sacrifice ourselves for another. We, again and again, as we are doing good listening, yield to the other through nonverbal nods, through eye contact, through short statements of empathy. Uh, that must have really been hard for you. Uh, through us echoing back or summarizing what we've heard just to, to help make sure that we, we have heard and to help them to feel heard asking clarifying questions that will help us to understand them better. And also, when, when we're doing good listening, you know, there is a time when we need to speak, if it's a conversation, but as we're speaking, we will pause often. That's a huge element to good listening. Even when we're brimming with a lot to say, Choose to make spaces for the other to speak. Instead of us controlling the conversation, see what they want to talk about. Particularly when we're giving advice or counsel. You know, give, give a thumbnail of your wisdom and then pause and see whether they pursue your wisdom, whether they're actually interested or not, or, you know, change the subject. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Someone said, we have two ears and one mouth, and we're to use them in that proportion. And if you do this well, sacrifice yourself in conversations, meaning that you are listening more than you are speaking. I guarantee that you'll be well liked in the next dinner or the next party that you go to. When you are listening, you do a little bit to raise the whole tenor of the gathering. Uh, the sense of well-being there will move toward heaven and away from hell. I... Uh, I crafted two other examples also, but two is enough. Uh, you get the idea. I want to close with this. Our job is not to try to bring in uh, a Christian civilization, not to try to make everybody do what we think they should do. There's a lot of cultural chaos. There's a lot in our culture that needs to be changed, needs, to, needs Jesus. But our first response should not be to try to change those around us, but simply for us to do what Jesus told us to do. That's, that's what we have control of as well. For us to constantly seek the interest of our neighbor rather than our own interest. And as we focus on loving sacrificially and humbly, out of that love, out of that obedience, will grow things like hospitals and universities, and, and we will move toward a more 
civilization the way that God wants it to be. But if we focus on passing legislation and building structures that make people moral and good, we're going to frustrate ourselves when it doesn't work. We're going to frustrate the others when it does work because no one likes you know, legislation making them do something. And we're going to frustrate Jesus, unfortunately, because too often we will start acting like the empire builders in the world around us, ones who are moving around by, through power over someone, not acting like Jesus. who was serving, who was bringing that power under, helping, doing things for others. Jesus taught us to pray, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. A good summary of God's will is people willing to let go of their self-interest for the sake of those around, loving others as we love ourselves. That summarizes God's law and the prophets. And not only... Does Jesus tell us to pray for that? But the Bible ends with a vision of that will being done on earth. A vision of heaven coming to earth. He showed me, this is Revelation 21.10, the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. He says, The glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp, and the nations will walk by its light. Verses 23 and 24, and then the next chapter, verse 2. In the middle of the city stood the tree of life, and the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nation. Let's, Let's feast on imagining what it will be like to have a life where... Jesus has returned. Jesus is Lord, and everyone is acknowledging that. And conversations are full of people living like Jesus, mutual, self-giving love, marriages likewise, and especially feast on the vision of nations walking by the Lamb of God's light. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, self-sacrifice is never easy by definition, but may this vision of what you want to bring about and, and as we see what your sacrifice did bring about, may that vision fuel us in this hard work of, of self-sacrifice. May our life together here in this church be a sign, be a foretaste of the life that you are going to bring when you come again. May it, may it draw people to you, make them hungry and thirsty for the life that is only found in you. Thank you also that that before you call us to to show sacrificial love you you show us such love you let us first experience your love we love because you first loved us and we rejoice and we do serve you because you are our lord and our savior and we bring this prayer, this heart cry to you because you invite us to come to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.